Hooray. Hooray. <laughs> Hello, Derek. <laughs> Dr. Hart, welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here with you. And I'd love to, I'd love to hear, there's um, one of these business leaders, Simon Sinek says, start with why. So I actually thought maybe we could start with why. You, you've, you've spent many decades in the field of, um, well, you're founder of the BioCybernaut Institute. What, uh, I guess I'm not sure the name of the field. Is that biofeedback, would you call the field you're in? Uh, well, in the larger field probably is uh, transformation. Uh, and then it's uh, personal growth, uh, raising consciousness. Uh, as you narrow it down, uh, it comes to um, feedback, biofeedback uh, generically. Uh, and within that, there's different types of feedback like muscle feedback and skin temperature feedback and galvanic skin response feedback and respiration feedback and uh, brainwave feedback. Brainwave, and so, and you're the brainwave guy, yes. Brainwave feedback, yes. So so maybe you could say why why this is important and why you why you do what you do. Uh, well, at some point, uh, uh, I was given a book by Greg Stewart, who's the first member of our Diamond Dozen Club, where people prepay for 12 trainings and get a 20% discount. And uh, somewhere along around his seventh training, he gave me a little book called Primal Branding. And in it are described seven characteristics of any technology or process that has gone global. And he said, Jim, BioCybernaut has all seven of these characteristics, including a cool founder story. So the founder story is probably the best way to have a cogent answer to your question, why do I do this? Because it really is a vocation. It's not a job. It's not a profession. It's not a career. It's a vocation. And the objectives of this vocation are to reduce suffering and to raise consciousness for all humanity while ushering in an enduring golden age for all humanity. At one point, one of my mentors, uh, Joe Camilla, who is the man who discovered uh, that people could voluntarily control their own brainwaves, was dismayed at how hardworking he, I was. And so, he at a staff meeting said, how can we stop Jim Hart from doing alpha feedback? Um, maybe we could pay him. No, that wouldn't work either. And so uh, there have been times where I've had no income for three years. And fortunately I had 15 credit cards and I supported my growth and development and uh, expansion of the technology. Uh, and at one point I had $360,000 of debt on 15 credit cards. And wow. so I don't do this to make money, although making money is helpful to expand and to make it available for more people, but I'm motivated by helping people to raise consciousness for all humanity. That's why I do it. And so the founder story, I'm a physics major at Carnegie Institute of Technology in my senior year fall semester. And I come out of the student union to be confronted by a large, beautiful hand painted sign where every letter was a different color. And it said, Dr. Joe Camilla will speak on brainwaves and consciousness and gave it time. And oh, that's just 10 minutes away. The building was right over here, Margaret Morrison uh, College, right across the tennis courts. And I didn't have a class that hour, so I went. I was the only person from the engineering college who went. It was, Joe had been visiting a woman painting and design professor and the, the attendees, except for Joe and the woman, were her students, plus me. And so I had been dialoguing with some friends at Duquesne University, also in Pittsburgh, who were studying phenomenology, uh, the studying the structure of uh, consciousness. And uh, that was very cool, it was very groovy, but like, how do you measure it? Well, suddenly here's a way to measure it, brainwaves. And I found pretty quickly that um, the brainwaves of yogis in the samadhi state, the superconscious state in yoga, 
or Zen monks in the Satori state, the superconscious state in Zen, were both characterized by extremely high alpha all over the head. Now, there were differences in the reactivity of that alpha, but the brainwaves rule, I've learned. That's one of our uh, trademarks is brainwaves rule. They rule your life. They rule your experiences. They rule your emotions, your feelings. You cannot have the experience of the color blue unless you have the brainwaves back in the occipital region for blue. And so if you learn to make those brainwaves internally and you had your eyes closed, you would still see blue. And so brainwaves rule. Okay, so I'm fascinated. I go to the library. Every spare minute of my senior year in physics is spent reading the uh, history of uh, brainwaves and the research that people had done. Brainwaves were first, alpha, uh, there was an Austrian psychiatrist named uh, Hans Berger, Herr Dr. Dr. Hans Berger. And uh, he was uh, born in Bavaria, had mystical roots. Bavaria didn't uh, suffer the descent into objectivism that was, that followed pretty much across Europe when Rene Descartes dreamed up science and famously said, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, meaning if you're not thinking, you don't exist, you don't value, you don't mean anything. But Bavaria resisted that. They had mystical roots and little Hans was born in Bavaria and absorbed that. So now he's a psychiatrist in Vienna and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was fighting one of its endless wars against the Muslims in uh, the Crimea, conscripted him into the army because he was educated. He was given a horse and made an officer. And in one of the battles, a horse was shot, fell on and broke his leg. He spent long months in a military hospital. When he gets back to Vienna, he gathers his family together uh, to tell the story. And halfway through, his sister uh, uh, interrupts him and takes him into her bedroom, shows him her Tagebuch, daybook, her diary, in which she had written all the details that he was describing. Well, so, yes, absolutely. So uh, Dr. Dr. Hans Berger suddenly believes in ESP and he'd heard about this guy in France, Volta, who was finding that uh, electricity could make frog legs jump. And so he went looking for electric waves in the brain and a very, very primitive technology, but he found them and he called them alpha because they were the first brain waves to be discovered. Now, alpha is not the fastest brainwave, it's not the slowest, but it's the biggest typically, and so easiest to find with his early primitive equipment. And so brainwave training spread all, I mean, brainwave monitoring spread across the world. Any advanced uh, country had to have brainwave technology. And so they studied like what makes brainwaves come and go? Uh, what's the effect of light? Uh, uh, what about bright light? What about a smaller bright light? What about dim light? What about a bigger dim light? What about sound? What about the frequencies of the sound? And so this constituted what I call the natural reactivity of alpha. The things in the environment that either facilitate you to have alpha or suppress it. And so I read all of that. I had a big stack of uh, I went through a lot of nickels of the copy machine. And, uh, I, had this huge stack of research articles and I had read all of them three times by the time I graduated in June and I jumped on my Triumph motorcycle and rode up into Canada across the Trans-Canadian Highway and then down I-5 and then into San Francisco. I showed up at Joe's lab and volunteered as a research subject. It was the most fascinating thing I'd ever done in my life. It made motorcycle riding pale by comparison. So I went back the second day for more and the third day for more. And when I went back on the fourth day, they weren't doing any studies. 